There is one word that will drive the future more than economics, more than innovation, more than customer services. And this word is more important than politics. This word is not to do just with technology. Here's a question I have. I've just shown you some new devices, like Google Glasses. Put your hands up if you would like to wear a pair of glasses connected to the internet. Right? Next question. Imagine that I can connect a computer chip to your brain so that your thoughts can be transmitted by computers from one human being to another. Actually, we have already done this in mice and rats. We are growing chips into brain tissue in animals, and animals are sending thoughts at the speed of light using wireless communication over thousands of miles. Put your hands up if you would like a chip inside your head to help you think. Oh, you see, we learned something. We have learned that the future is not about innovation. I learned. It's not about smart technology. The future will be driven by one word, and this word has driven all of human history and will drive the next thousand years of tomorrow. This word, of course, is not about the technology, it's about emotion. It's about the fact that you don't want a chip inside your head. It's about the fact that maybe you're not so sure about wearing Google glasses. It's about connecting with the passions people have, and this, of course, is the secret of the future of retail, a customer focus. And it is easy for us to be blind to how the customer is actually feeling. Let me give you an example of this. Imagine that uh, you were watching TV last night and you saw your favorite actress and you typed her name into your iPad to find out how old she is and you pressed on her website and nothing happened and you waited how long will you wait before you press the back button on the ipad think about it one two how many seconds would you wait before you press the back button on the browser because the web page is too slow. Put your hands up if you press the back button in less than 10 seconds. Okay, I want to see. Put your hands up if you press the back button in less than 5 seconds. My friends, you have shown me this. In Bulgaria today, 95% of all your customers on the web will be lost in five seconds. Five seconds is like a million years today. Why does this matter? Because in three seconds you became irritated. In four seconds you're beginning to get annoyed. In five seconds you're saying, I'm out. Five seconds is enough to create an emotion in a customer. Next question. In your store, how long does it take to process a transaction? How long does it take to buy something online? How long does it take to find the customer representative? Five seconds is like a million years, as you have shown me. So, big trend is convenience stores. Stores that are open all night, every hour of every day. Small store, because small is fast, because small is close to my home, small is quick to serve, small is instant choice, 
small, takes my life and gives it back to me. Here is another example of this, which is in the, in the online world. If you can find a way to speed up the customer journey through your website by 10 seconds, you gain extra customers. Just a single field can be enough. Here is another example of this, uh, this sensitivity of customers. I wonder if you have ever had money taken from your bank without your permission. I have had money taken by the electricity company. They stole my money. They charged me twice for the same bill. Okay? So I, I, I phoned the electricity company and uh, I get through on the phone and they say, press 1 for customer service, press 2 for accounts, press 3 for this, press 4 for that. Put your hands up if you find that very annoying when you have to press these buttons. <laughs> Put your hands up if you think the government should pass a law to make it a crime to put such a system in and put people in prison who install it. <laughs> okay, now here's the embarrassing question. Put your hands up if your own company uses such a system. <laughs> what happened? What happened was we became blind to our customers. We have focused on the bottom line on what made business sense, and we forgot to take our own glasses off and to put our customers' glasses on. And, uh, you know, this is uh, fundamental. <laughs> this is why I love mystery shopping so much. It's when we pretend to be a customer and we walk into one of our own stores to buy a product and see what happens. Uh, mega chains is another big trend. I'm going to show many trends very quickly. In many EU nations, including my country, the UK, 70% of all retail spending is in seven or eight companies only. And that is likely to happen here. It's only a matter of time. I would say 60 to 70% of all spending will be in six or seven key chains. The big question is, which ones? And at the same time, we can expect, therefore, very rapid consolidation of retail outlets in Bulgaria, as, uh, as we find big chains wiping out smaller ones. And connected with this, uh, the development of more huge miles. Yes, even more. We can expect very rapid growth of malls for several reasons. I'm not now talking about malls only for super wealthy, but I'm talking about uh, shopping experiences uh, for mid-range consumers, and a bit lower than that as well. At the moment, we have these uh, very luxurious shopping malls that are being created, and they look like uh, what you see in the airport with many international brands. And you may have a question about how many more malls can be built in Sofia and still make money. I would say many more for a reason. If we look at the growth of malls in uh, Bulgaria, we can see how much happened in 2010. The pink is new. And then, of course, the uh, things stopped, and then we started again. Uh, but if we look at the shopping centre stock per city, we see Sophia right at the top. But if we look at the number of square metres of mile per thousand residents, then Sophia is right down here. There are other places where they are already far ahead. And this tells me that there is plenty of room for growth here and that we have really only just started. And it will put pressure on many of the traditional retailers as has happened across the rest of the world. And we are seeing 
a, a complete uh, reshaping of the traditional shopping streets, many of which uh, in some countries are now becoming residential. Because people prefer to go to where the big experience is and then it's very difficult for the small retailer to cope unless they also move into a shopping centre or close to a shopping centre. Now part of the shopping centre experience is a focus on leisure, a destination and it's about uh, feeling, seeing, touching. Uh, it's sometimes about uh, not just in a shopping centre, it's about a pedestrianised street where people perform, they do acrobatics, uh, it's exciting, it's fun, we go for the life, we go to see things happen, and we watch other people, uh, and we observe their life, we engage, and uh, we take children with us, and we expect them to have an adventure, as well as come back with clothes or food. And in the middle of this growth of huge, a huge growth of a small number of super companies, we will also continue to see growth of uh, what I call niche traders. Small, specialist, focused, individual, character, knowledge, highly personal, and these kinds of stores are doing well in every city across Europe and will continue to do well here. Now of course, the economic times have been really hard. And when times are hard, brands get bust. And people move from the brands which they like to cheaper brands and then to budget brands. And we've seen this happening on a very large scale in different parts of Europe. And the budget brands have grown. At the same time, some of the super brands have grown. The straight. There are some people who have become even more wealthy. But others have been squeezed and the middle has really suffered. And uh, you can expect at the same time brands within brands inside these superstores. So, uh, even more. So you have one superstore, which now, uh, this chain may be taking uh, maybe 5% of all retail sales in the whole of Bulgaria. But inside this store, we're now seeing uh, sub-brands within the, the uh, big brand that uh, may be a little, or it might be a Carrefour, or it might be uh, one of your own uh, brands here, but uh, this is uh, Tesco, and this is the organic sub-brand. This is Tesco finest uh, brand. This is the premium brand inside Tesco as a superstore. And you will find inside Tesco 10 or 12 or 15 sub-brands. Each of them has their own coloring, their own identity, their own logo, but they are all Tesco. And connected with this is the, uh, the watching the customer, literally with a camera, watching where their eyes move, how they walk around the store, where they stop, what pulls their eye this way or that, where do we put the bargain, where do you put the bread, and where does the fish go? The location of the fish in the store is really important. It has to be in exactly the right place in the customer journey. Which is why all the big chains put their fruit and vegetables at the beginning. They put their big smells, the fresh bread, uh, very close to the beginning. They put their big wine and uh, alcohol at the end. Because they know how you think, how you move. And this data creates profit for retailers. And it's exactly the same in a huge multi-store like Technopolis. The customer journey can also be mapped. 
We're also going to see growth of self-service, where uh, I know there have been experiments already here, but uh, uh, where the customer is invited to check themselves out. And uh, this uh, saves money, uh, it uh, can create some security issues, it, it can mean that you lose some product, it has to be worth. Well, I said that we've had a move from uh, the middle brand, uh, quality brands to uh, less expensive and then to budget. At the same time, the world has never seen so many sales of absolute top level premium products. Really expensive things. And these, uh, this is because of the growth in the gap between the very wealthiest in every country and the very poorest. And shops that provide for this premium experience are doing very well. Now here is another interesting thing. In many parts of Europe, the countries are under pressure. In my country, for example, uh, we, our population was falling quite quickly. In parts of my country, in Germany, in Greece, in Italy, and indeed in parts of Bulgaria, you need eight great-grandparents to produce a single great-grandchild. It's because the number of children per couple here in Bulgaria is now around 1.2 or 1.3. So we, can, we know that one in three Bulgarians will be over 65 by 2050, unless something changes, and it might. And we know that only 50% of the population will be of working age by then. But things can change. In my country, it has changed dramatically. Our country was heading for a big crisis. Suddenly we are growing. You see, you either have to make babies or you have to import them. <laughs> you have to buy them from somewhere. And as they come, people bring their own customs and their own culture. And I know there has been in the news just recently, in the last month, about Syrian refugees coming. I'll tell you, this is sensitive. I know these things are sensitive. But people who come are new markets. In my community in London, we have seen an explosion of Polish shops. Because one million people from Poland came to the UK. And uh, actually 600,000 have gone home. They made money, they have gone home. But they all bought things. And they were looking for Polish food, uh, a Polish technician to explain how to install a Polish TV in a Polish home. They're looking for service, for cultural understanding, new markets. And my observation is this, that often those that travel the longest distance, who are most desperate to move, uh, are uh, extremely well qualified, much better qualified than the average people at home. Uh, you may find the doctors, the nurses, the clinics, the graduates, they're coming. They're taking basic jobs here or in London, but they are building wealth. They are keen to work. They are creating the wealth of the future. They are new markets and opportunities for every business in London, in Manchester, in other parts of the UK. But the needs of older people are very different. And uh, the big question is, Older customers, middle-aged customers, young customers, how do we meet their different needs and provide the right products, the right services, and the right channels for them? It all depends on who you are. And now we're going to see at the point. Wasn't that great? I really enjoyed that. And uh, I want to take us back to this couple here. And uh, you imagine that this old woman was walking just now. And uh, what's the first thing she needs when she's shopping? 
the most important thing for anyone over 65 when they're shopping is, of course, <laughs> somewhere to sit. Somewhere to sit. Okay, this is a question to men. Put your hands up if you have been shopping with your wife for clothes in the last year. Okay, put your hands up if you are looking for somewhere to sit whilst you got changed. Did you find it? Yes? No. Okay. Chairs are very important as part of retailing. It's the quickest way to sell a product because when they're sitting down, oh, hello, how can I help you? And now we're in a big conversation. So it's the little things. It's not just uh, seating. I'll come back to it. There's something else as well. Countries are different. Uh, in my country, 75% of all the wealth is owned by those over the age of 50. So if we look at the, uh, uh, the growth of uh, spending, we are seeing growth in the oldest group, more than 55 year olds, growing, growing, growing. The youngest groups, not so much. I know it's different in different countries, but if we think of restaurants in Sofia, I know that many of the best restaurants have people in them who are 50, 55, 56, very successful. Some of them are you. The big question is, when you go to a restaurant and you're sitting about to have a meal and you're ordering your menu and you pick up the menu to read it, put your hands up if you need your glasses to read it. You have to put your glasses on to read the restaurant menu. Okay? It's because we're getting old. Because we are over the age of 50. But here is a crazy thing. Here is a menu for the restaurant. This is the primary marketing document for the restaurant, is the menu. And a primary customer group are those over the age of 50, and none of us can read it. None of us, because we're all so old that we need glasses to read. I went to a restaurant recently in Singapore. It was so dark and the restaurant menu was printed so small that even with my glasses, I couldn't read it. And the, 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 waiter, the waiter came round with a torch. He said, sir, here is the torch for me to light up the menu so you can read it. <laughs> so it's an example of how, again, we are blind to our customers. And we need to understand how our customers think, what they can see, what they can't see. And this takes me to the online boom. Because here, all kinds of things are happening that we don't see. For example, this year, we will see 12 uh, we will see one trillion dollars of e-commerce sales around the world. In my country, it's now over 10% of all retailing and growing very fast. And you might say it's different here, but I'm not so sure. Let's look at this. This is the internet use, 1990 through to 2012 in Bulgaria, Greece, Romania. You can see the lines are quite similar. And where are they going? <laughs> Very high. Next question. What are people buying online in Bulgaria? The statistics show that clothes, sports and goods, that's 64% uh, of people who are buying online are buying those. Travel and holiday, books, magazines and so on. Price comparison sites are driving a huge growth in online uh, sales. There are over 100 price comparison sites in your country alone. There are hundreds across the rest of Europe. And these sites are a huge challenge for the future of retailing. They are very important for the customer. So we have the customer uh, going, this is me going into a Sony store 
and I come straight out because all I do is I, I, I take a picture of the barcode of a TV with my, with my iPhone and within seconds I have many, many, many different retailers I can go to for exactly the same product. So we saw here the, uh, the older woman, she's very impressed with this box. In fact, she would never have believed that you could have a robot to clean your home. She had to see it. She had to touch it to believe it was true. But at that moment, the shop is about to lose this sale. Because the shop assistant, before the shop assistant has even got to her, her daughter is busy on the iPhone. Her daughter has said, uh, no mother, we're not going to buy it here. I want to buy it now. No, 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 no. It will cost us too much money. We will order it from Amazon. And so we have a phenomenon in many countries now where the customer is going to the retail store. They are having a long conversation with the sales representative. They are feeling, trying, turning things on. And when they make their decision, they say uh, goodbye. <laughs> or they start buying inside the store because they discover that this same product is cheaper on the website of this company than in the store. So they are now checking the online price and say, I'm ordering it online. The other day, I was ordering a present for my wife. And uh, I was in the store. First, I started online, at home on the computer. Then, uh, on the way, I was carrying on searching on the smartphone. I wanted to see this product. I wanted to touch it. I wanted to check it out. Because there were so many models. It was a food mixer. And when I had finally made the choice, I tried to uh, pick up the box and I suddenly realized it was too big. <laughs> I couldn't take it home. I, I wanted to go on the train, on the metro. So at that point I knew I had to order it online. So I went to the store, ordered it online, I'm now ordering it from this, this store and then I realized that I could get it cheaper somewhere else. So all kinds of things are happening. It's a big challenge and it's not just it's not just the, uh, the cleaning equipment, it's not just the, uh, the uh, do-it-yourself, it's not just the bicycles, it's furniture, it's kitchens. Price comparison is a tough area. And uh, if we look, this is just one of your price comparison sites. And the, the harder life is for people in the economy, the more they are interested in ways to save just 10 euros. And especially with social media. Because they start communicating with friends. Maybe in the store they're talking on Facebook. They're saying, am I being silly? Is this a bad thing to do? I have just seen a robot. Amazing robot. I'm just about to buy it. And suddenly, boom, 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 boom. Ten friends are saying, don't buy it. I've just seen it online. Uh, so we have friends, advising friends. It's, uh, it, it applies to non-physical products. In Italy, we have seen sales increase by 58% on price comparison sites for car insurance. It's just part of what's happening. And all this is linked to how retailers are communicating with their customers. It's the future of marketing. In my country, uh, one third of people have stopped watching TV. Uh, why? Because they are watching it uh, using the web instead. So it's difficult to plan a TV campaign. Uh, Google has uh, changed the whole relationship that products have with customers. And as I, as I say, social media is increasingly important. Uh, here is a website. 
Imagine it's a website of a hotel in London and you are going to stay in my city next week. So you type in the name of the hotel and the first listing on Google is Wonderful Hotel. Fantastic. The second listing on Google is Terrible. Uh, rats. Food poisoning. Don't ever stay there. And on the right hand side, which is where Google wants it, is the official advertisement for the hotel group. A, a link to the website written by the marketing director with a, with a short uh, a comment by the CEO about the quality of the hotel. Now you have one mouse click only and I am doing a global survey so I'm interested in your own views uh, compared to other audience, audiences I have spoken to. I want you to think where do you go first? Which did you click on first? Was it the good story? Was it the official story about the, from the marketing department? Or was it the story about the rats? Put your hands up if you go first for the good story. Hello? There must be one or two. <laughs> Put your hands up if you go for the official marketing site to get the truth about the hotel. Three. Put your hands up if very sadly you are really worried about the rats. Now what we learned is this. Oh, by the way, who was it that wrote the comment about the beautiful hotel? Of course it was the manager of the hotel. You knew this. And who was it that wrote the story about the rats? Competitor, yes. <laughs> we know this. You know this, I know this, but every time I press on the story about the rats. So I will believe, you believe, the opinion of a stranger more than the opinion of the official marketing department. It has more power, even though you know that this opinion here was probably created not by a customer, but actually by a competitor. So what does this mean? What it means is this. I had dinner recently with five people. They were the, uh, they owned companies which control 70% of all global advertising in the whole world. And they agreed with me that traditional marketing is dead. It's coming to an end. Why? Because, think about it. Imagine this hotel runs a huge TV campaign in Bulgaria and everybody starts typing the name of the hotel into Google. What will they see? They will simply learn stories about rats. And the more they spend on TV advertising, the more people will type their name into Google, the more people will learn about the rats. So in fact, it would be better not to advertise on TV at all. Now, I am, of course, exaggerating a little bit to make us think. I'm just illustrating that today, all of us are being influenced a huge amount, more than we ever realize, by the comments of complete strangers. And trust, building trust in our brand based on customer service is the number one way to go retailing in tomorrow's world. Now we come back to mobile marketing and uh, we had here the example of the woman who was and not paying any attention to her friend in the restaurant. Um, and uh, marketing uh, uh, needs to understand that mobile is more than a channel. It's a way of life. Look at these people. I filmed this all in less than 30 seconds to one minute. Uh, 30 seconds is enough on an escalator to open a phone and watch TV. Multi-channel, multi-dimensional. And the next big thing the next big thing uh, in Bulgaria, in Europe, in the rider world is location. It's understanding what the customer is doing 
and where they are. It's knowing that they are in a taxi right now going to work. We know that. The telco company knows that. They can plot it. They see the same journey every day it happens. They can see what you have done recently. They can see which taxi you're in. The taxi maybe can see your phone. It can see in the internet of things a little transmitter in your glasses which the retailer uses to track its product. Uh, you, it, it's a question of understanding uh, where this person is right now. By the way, if you think this is office or home, home maybe, <laughs> is this a man or a woman? I'm not sure. Uh, where is he? What is he doing? I tell you, he's probably in the toilet. And he's probably been there for 20 minutes doing his emails. And then his boss phoned him. He says, where are you? He says, I'm at home working. And the boss doesn't understand exactly what's happening. It's a question of, of, uh, of, of understanding how we can engage with the customer. This is for an insurer. We can uh, reduce the customer support costs. We can boost cross-selling. We can send an SMS uh, giving progress on the insurance claim. Uh, we can fuse with social media, all to do with the phone and how we communicate. And mobile payment is another big trend. Cash is really expensive across the EU. It costs 60 billion euros a year just to handle pieces of paper and coins. But 70% of all mobile payments in the world are happening outside of Europe, outside of America, outside of Asia. 70% of all mobile payments are taking place in one place in the world, which is Africa. They're taking place actually in, mainly in Kenya. Kenya is driving a revolution in retail payments using one platform and Pisa and this platform is responsible now for one-third of all Kenya's GDP and the biggest driver is remittances it's sending money home uh, it might be uh, uh, to uh, from the city to the rural area to support the children it might be uh, because uh, one of them is now working from Nairobi they have moved and they are now in Sofia working as a waiter and they're sending money home using MPSA. So MPSA has grown very fast and alongside it lots of mechanisms for handling credit cards and things attached to mobile phones. Uh, this is a square a device called Square. Uh, they cost nothing for retailers. Uh, you can attach it to any phone and you become instantly a credit card transactor. And you might be a, a street vendor selling uh, MPSA, whatever it is. There are 1.7 billion people in the world who have mobile phones, but they don't have a bank. They have never saved money in a bank account. They don't have insurance, but they have MPSA, or they could have something like that. So we are seeing this revolution that's taking place, this fusion of banking and retail, retail banking and retail telecommunications. And it's coupled with new innovation. For example, the new iPhone allows me to detect my own fingerprint, which means that I can make a secure transaction, which is safer than any other kind of trans transaction, maybe, in the future. I just by putting my thumb on the mobile and pressing yes to accept. Now, you might say yes, but this is different here. You might say Romania, uh, Romania, Bulgaria, Slovakia, Turkey, all these countries are different. You might say it's different from Sofia and Belgrade. I agree. All I'm saying is this, that if we go back, and I, I should go back to a slide I showed you before, and uh, we see that um, a huge growth in the number of smartphones, 24% sales growth of smartphones just in the last 12 months. Almost every phone sold in the whole world in 2017 will be a smartphone. So every phone user will be online 
in Bulgaria by 2018, 2019. Every one of them uh, into a world where location is becoming important, where the taxi perhaps can begin to sense where they are, where they could be doing anything, anywhere, anytime, where mobile payments are becoming perhaps part of their own future, not with a bank, but just sending money to a friend at almost zero cost. So it's a very strange, exciting time of change. It's a world where we can, and my telco clients are, are considering a radical future where the cost of providing telecommunications is falling towards zero, of giving you an iPad, of changing your, your, your BlackBerry every year, of maybe giving you uh, your own mobile, uh, 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 some other device that you want. The cost of giving you unlimited video calls, the cost of giving you unlimited voice calls with r roaming across the whole of Europe for free, the cost of doing such things is falling towards zero. And the amount of money they can raise by capturing every transaction on the mobile is rising fast. And the point is coming for many telcos and many banks where they might be able to give all the technology away to higher value customers just to be certain that you're using the phone for all the transactions. And if you start to do that, then a lot of things uh, fall into place. I'm not telling you the future. I'm telling you history because it is already happening in various countries. And then finally we see the fusion of the online and the offline worlds as we've talked about. And this, uh, all these themes start to come together. And it doesn't matter whether it's the bicycle, whether it's the uh, materials, whether it's the do-it-yourself, the, uh, the white goods, whatever it is, it all becomes fused into one continuous retail experience. And uh, here we're seeing also confusion about uh, people who buy in the store to have delivered at home. Or they go to the store, they order online. And another part of this is where the product is delivered. If you look at the UK now, this year, 1.3 billion boxes will be delivered to people's homes. Things that could be as large as this, a product as big as one of these. 1.3 billion parcels being delivered to people's homes. But what happens when the person is not at home? That's the question. How many times do you have to take the same vacuum cleaner to the same house hoping that someone will be in? And the answer is it's getting very expensive. So it's also very inconvenient for the customer. So what's happened is there's been an explosion of new delivery places. It started in Germany and it is spreading fast across the whole of the European Union and they're called parcel shops or some other a name. There are several brands. In the UK we have seen 3,000 parcel shops in the last 12 months. Now, Remember me saying that these smaller shops are coming under pressure to close, to become part of a big chain. But now we have some hope for the smaller shop. A chemist, a small pharmacy, which is not inside Lidl or Carrefour, but is on the corner of your street near your home, 100 meters away from your apartment, and has become the place where you have your parcels delivered. And so every day you come home, you walk past the pharmacy, and he says, I have something for you. He says, thank you. And these, uh, these, uh, these arrangements, of course, are good for the retailer, because if you go to collect your parcel from the pharmacy, you're saying, actually, while I'm there, have you any medicine for coughs? Um, and I have something else as well. And you're starting to revive the relationship 
with the small retailer. So, it's uh, interesting how it all fits together. It's all about speed, which is what we learned at the beginning, because three seconds is an eternity, five seconds is like a million years, and if something can save me three hours, it's very worthwhile. But to do it, it means a huge investment in delivery infrastructure, in the new gold standard for delivery at home or anywhere else is not 24 hours, it's becoming, it will become same day, same day delivery, because the online channel is so slow. If I go to the store, I get the product immediately. If I order it online, I have to wait 5 seconds, 20 seconds, I have to wait 24 hours. It's really slow. And already we are seeing supply chains from the wholesaler to the retailer in businesses like auto spares to garages and to pharmacists uh, from the wholesaler. And we're, we will see increasing sophistication in some of these chains allowing products to be delivered within six hours to people where the product is a valuable one. Systems, processes, you might say, Patrick, this is a million miles into the future. I'm not telling you the future, I'm telling you history, these things are already here. The big question is simply, by when will they become big trends in Sophia? I don't know the answer to that, but I would say on the experience of what has happened in places like Ukraine, uh, in Russia, in Kazakhstan, in uh, Vietnam. Do you know Vietnam <coughs> has salary costs which are half those of China? I was in Vietnam in November, last November, and Intel has just spent one billion dollars building a new chip factory in Vietnam because China is too expensive. Who wants to make things in China anymore? In little Vietnam, with its very low income per person, there are more mobile phones than there are human beings. And they are accelerating their growth of e-commerce at incredible speed. We're talking about the, a world beyond mobile. A world where billions of items are labelled as part of the web. Where every product you buy, whether it's a piece, whether it's a bicycle or just the seat of the bicycle, they all have a tag. And if you take the bicycle seat out, you'll see it. This little tag, it's the size of a grain of sand. It has its own radio transmitter. It's called a radio frequency identification device. It's simply a wireless barcode. It means that the bicycle manufacturer can locate every seat within one meter on the surface of the globe. So long as the, uh, the right uh, receivers are present, it means that we can have perfect instant stock control wherever we are. It means a world where we can monitor retail supply chains in a way that we've never been able to before. Not just retail, but in major manufacturing. One of my clients is Airbus. And Airbus is building the 350 right now. And there are 1.5 million different components in the supply chain of this aircraft. And every one of those components is tracked in real time across the surface of the earth. Tokyo Motor, if you think of Audi in an A6, there are 85 door components. That's 50,000 product combinations for a customer just in the design of a door. Internet of Things. And when you build the Internet of Things together, with all the information that we learn when we capture all those payments on the phone and all the location data that we have for being able to see you move around the store physically just using phone data. It creates what we call big data. 
90% of all data created on Earth in the whole of human history has been made in the last 24 months. And the genius for retailing in the future will be to make sense of these insights so that we can form a picture which is useful to us in understanding what kind of offers to make, what kind of relationship to have, how often to contact. It's a shift from marketing at people to walking with them on the journey of life and whispering in their ear as they go along. So it might be that as they are looking at, as they are looking at a washing machine, we're able to send a text to them at that very moment, saying your loan has been approved by PMB Paribas for the item you are in this area of the store. Now you might think, oh, I'm not sure I want people to know this amount of information about me. It's a question of consent. It's working with customers to build trust. And say, I would like um, my telco company to know. I'm happy for the bank to see me so that they can give me the right offers yeah. at the right time. They can save me money and make my life easier. So in conclusion, it's about one customer. One customer at home, at work, offline, online. One customer in sales. One customer on the phone, one customer using your mobile, one customer who's online and suddenly the chat screen comes up and the telesales person is there saying, would you like to turn this web purchase into a telephone call? I'm waiting for you now. One customer, one emotion, one set of thoughts and ideas, one human being on a journey of life, one person looking for your help, looking for quality, not always looking for the best price, but looking for the best experience, the best after-sales support, buying from a brand they really trust, from a retailer that they really understands them, uh, buying uh, from a, a product that they have experienced in the past that gives them confidence for the future. And as we pay attention to all of these things, and as we focus on how the customer feels, and taking off our own glasses, and putting on the glasses of our customer, then we will find all kinds of new insights that will enable every single retailer here to prosper and grow in tomorrow's world, and providing the products and services which delight and surprise the next generation of customers across Bulgaria. And I wish you every success in your own retailing future. Thank you very much.